Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final lecture of environmentally conscious petroleum engineering and the roadmap for sustainable well construction and zero emissions course at Paya Petro. I hope all of you are doing well. My name is Rahima Babayeva, and I'm a graduate from the University of Aberdeen. I have finished Master of Science in Petroleum Engineering, and I am going to be your moderator for today's session on behalf of Arab Oil and Gas Academy. Today's webinar is going to be about rebranding petroleum engineering from hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon to hydrogen, a roadmap for zero emissions and long drive for carbon fuel by Professor Rafiq Laval. Professor Rafiq Laval is the author of the leading chapter titled Environmental Conscious Petroleum Engineering in the book Environmental Conscious Fossil Fuel Production, John Wiley, 2010. He's currently located in Lubbock, West Texas, and served as a professor of petroleum engineering at the American University of Ras al Khaimah in the United Arab Emirates. Now, before uh, starting today's session, I'd like to mention that you can ask your question from Q&A part and three to five questions will be answered by Professor Rafi Gulawal. Let's welcome Professor Rafi Gulawal. Uh, Professor, we are delighted to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Rahima. And uh, good morning from Texas. Uh, it is 10 a.m. in the morning. And uh, to all my viewers and attendees, uh, thank you very much for coming back and those who are new because of uh, 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 latest connections. So welcome. And uh, so this is uh, the concluding day, the fourth day of my involvement in uh, sharing uh, our uh, concern or our interest in the subject that we are in the energy business which includes uh, petroleum, crude oil, natural gas, coal, the greatest, the largest source of energy, and from the industrial revolution period that enabled us to jump ship from the classical world to the modern world. And now new sources of energy have been added up in this sector, the art or the geo sector, like coal, wet, methane. Uh, at least I know in the last uh, year of my doctoral study at the University of Oklahoma, Norman, probably in 1989. Yes, I was uh, asked by the famous professor, uh, uh, Dr. Farooq Sivan, the author of uh, the famous textbook Formation Damage, and uh, he's well known. And uh, uh, he was uh, my professor, my committee chair. And he also asked me, the, Mohammed, you are a teaching assistant, you get paid for that, but can you also help me with my research program? I have many, and one of them is uh, coal bed methane. I said, Professor, my pleasure. So coal bed methane, I love it. Uh, we never knew that there could be methane from coal bed. And now we know this global concern about CO2 emissions, along with other greenhouse gases, warming, warming up the climate and uh, impacting our civilization, as a matter of fact, uh, starting with our time and probably if unchecked, it will make life more difficult uh, for our grandchildren and their children. So we don't want to do that. So uh, I mentioned carbon uh, coal bed methane at this point because there is an opportunity. Like all these other fossil fuels I mentioned, and you know, of course, uh, uh, this uh, coal bed methane, has a distinct feature. It can take carbon dioxide as a means of carbon capture and sequestration. Wonderful. But not many decision makers, I repeat, decision makers at the political level, head of governments, including United States of America, and more importantly, the big 
international oil companies, of the large independent oil companies in America, and also the national oil companies, we know them all over the world, especially in the Middle East, they are not taking stock of this two-in-one feature of coal bed methane. For example, we mentioned in uh, yesterday that uh, the 17th largest uh, oil company in the world, which is ExxonMobil, or number two or three among this, uh, uh, these uh, international oil companies, alongside BP, British Petroleum, within parenthesis, and Shale Oil Company, uh, and there are others, of course. They are not talking much about this. And because of Paris Agreement, now is being enforced by about 140 countries in their respective, within their sovereign realm, and that's a government pressure, you must commit to CO2 emissions cut down by certain amount, and that amount is huge. ExxonMobil has announced, not implemented yet, announced $100 billion. Too big to believe, I'll not believe until they do it. Why I'm saying this? Because in US, there are small players, but they're very bona fide, like the, our gas stations, the distributors. One of the chain is called over here in the Texas area, uh, Stripes, you know, S-T-R-I-P-E-S. -E so along the highway, inside the cities, we have the gas stations or the pump stations where we go to refill our tank they have already committed $40 million. They're small. There's no comparison between the big guys and them. And they have spent that money through a third party who have injected CO2 back into some deep cell informations or whatever. Uh, so I wish these bona fide companies who are sincere in their effort to fall in line with the Paris Agreement and encouraged by the respective governments, you know, come to know about this two-in-one characteristic or feature of cold wet methane. Why two-in-one? Because when you inject carbon dioxide as a meta under your program of carbon capture and sequestration, CCS, you also you spend lots of money, like this company has spent $40 million. But you can also get money back. How? This carbon dioxide has a better affinity to the coal, you know, the coal layers we call coal cleats or whatever it is, then the resident methane. So they, the moment this CO2 gets inside this coal bed, they do one thing first, without mercy, then kick out or knock out the methane molecules, the coal bed methane. It is just like, you know, the new world, this America, uh, after Columbus, quote unquote, discovered it. He didn't discover it, of course. Now we will all accept. He just found it. And then what happened? And then the Spanish people, they want, no, Spanish, Spanish king sent their ships with soldiers to South America to the local people, the Aztec, and what they call the original people of this country. They are almost museum piece now. Uh, it is historical fact. I have uh, no, uh, I mean, issue with that because that's a matter of past. But what I'm saying that thing happens in nature also. Carbon dioxide, once it is injected, let's say only 
by smart guys, smart companies, you know, in, in, inside uh, uh, this uh, coal. And the coal is everywhere. They are much more than in, uh, than we have oil and gas reservoirs in terms of net amount of energy stored therein. This is a fact. And the deeper you go in coal mines, higher is the pressure, we know why, and higher is the methane resident there. So the requirement of CO2 sequestration is that you have to inject in deep reservoirs so that they are locked in there, that's forever, all right, whatever it means, forever. And that is also becoming um, becomes more expensive because you have to drill deep wells. Deep wells cost more money. Almost it goes exponentially. From 1,000 feet to 2,000 feet, the cost is maybe linearly increasing. But when you go to 2,000 to 3,000, it jumps. And 3,000 to 5,000, wow, huge rise. The graph becomes an exponential. And if we talk about 5,000 plus, it becomes very expensive, millions of dollars for one well. And now, then you have to pump CO2s with pumping stations, and the CO2 will come from other company who will capture them, so you have to pay again. So it becomes very expensive, but you have to do it because of Paris Agreement. Now what if that deep reservoir is cold wet methane? The moment you start pumping, you have another well, let's say a few hundred meters apart, you will get commercial production of methane. We call it cold wet methane. And methane is, by the way, at this time, or at least for another 10 to 20 years, it will be the best bet for us whether you are the first signatory in Paris Convention or the last one. Everyone needs energy. Solar is there, but not it enough to cater to our needs. And the wind, very limited, small, very small babies. But the big guys are the fossil fuels, and the best among the fossil fuel is natural gas. So this is the best highway in this transition period from classical energy, who is uh, because of the you know, way we use them to energize our industry or our transportation, gives CO2, also releases other things. So this is, and I wanted to emphasize on that because uh, uh, you know, when these uh, big companies, uh, uh, in oil and gas business, they don't talk about carbon, uh, carbon, uh, coal bed methane. That is a signature that they don't know it. So teach them, tell them whether they listen or not. That depends on them. If you meet the chief of, you know, some vice president of BP or Exxon Mobil or Saudi Aramco or China National Oil Company or Petrobras, wherever you go, tell them, do you know? And probably they will uh, look, what does it mean? Do you grind coal, burn it to produce methane? I said, no, 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 that is deep inside, just like oil is there, just like gas is there. And, and uh, I'll not be surprised because once I used to work as a research engineer at King Fahd, University of Petroleum and Minerals. And it's a very excellent university. It was then, and I believe it is now also. As we know, it is ranked number one in the MENA, Middle East and North African regions, number one. And uh, I have no doubt that they have, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, they deserve it. And, and their petroleum engineering program, they still call petroleum engineering, and uh, uh, the chair, uh, the dean of uh, the this uh, uh, college of uh, geosciences, 
petroleum and geosciences, you know, uh, is uh, my contemporary. He was my manager at the research institute uh, of the university at that time from 1991 through I think 2000. Uh, I hope uh, uh, I'll send these uh, four presentations, two of them I've sent, that it is time to rebrand and I'll talk about why to rebrand. And uh, uh, I have slightly changed it. Uh, this is title, Rebranding Petro Engineering. All right, but the subtitle I have changed to Let's Produce Hydrogen from the Fossil Energy Sources. Before, as advertised, it was uh, hydrogen from uh, hydrocarbon. But uh, I really mean, or I meant, fossil energy sources, meaning that it includes this uh, energy portfolio, uh, includes coal and coal with methane, okay? And uh, of course, uh, geothermal uh, is also, and a half of geothermal is also fossil, uh, if you like, not fossil in the sense that it is stored hot water in deep inside the earth, you know, in sedimentary rocks. Uh, so it is nature's own creation. If you drill a hole in those hydrothermal reservoirs, hot water from 120 degrees to 200 degrees Celsius, that's good enough to produce and get lots of steam from it, high pressure, okay, and drive turbines, which will generate electricity. But the other much bigger chunk, like the hidden part of an iceberg, is called hot dry rock, which is basalt in onshore, sorry, granite in onshore and basalt in offshore. That means the igneous rock, this two, uh, the twin igneous rock. I remember my days of uh, teaching physical geology at American University of Ras al Khaima. And it was in the all quizzes. I keep changing my questions from year to year, but I never change this particular question that the basement rock or igneous rock under the oceans, is it granite or basalt? So even sometimes I have to play any, mini, mini, mo. Which one? So, but at one point I said, come on, remember it. So in the ocean, offshore, it is basalt. Igneous rock, it is born in the same way, but uh, I think it gets uh, less time to become solidified from its molten state, which is called uh, magma or lava. So it has finer crystals. Forgive me for going to geology, where we are born within that framework. And, and it will help you someday, okay? Uh, and when it is onshore, like in California uh, or in Australia or everywhere in the world, if you drill just for the fun of it, like the Russians did or the Soviet did in Kola Peninsula in sometimes in 1978, they wanted to see, they had all the money, Soviet, you know, Soviet, now gone. Uh, they had the money. So let us see what is deep in the earth. They were the first one to send men into space, Yuri Gagarin, to discover is there God? And Yuri Gagarin, after orbiting the earth for 96 minutes in 1961 or 60, you know, I was, I think, a toddler, still on Cedillac. Okay. So now, later on, I followed him through literature. And he came down safe, thank God, that time. And the first thing the government Soviet journalist asked him to tell the world, did you see God? And he said, no, there is no God. And the next time, in the second flight, he went there, he didn't come back. He was burned alive in his Sputnik or whatever. So we say that he is... But basically, he saw God that time, you know. That's what we say. Uh, may God be merciful to him. 
we have high respect for him, okay? And then they went to the other side, down, down, down. Drill, 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 drill. They have all the money, they have the engineer, engineering. They drill to 21,000 feet in Kula Peninsula, near the North Sea, inside Soviet realm, you know? And they had to stop because it was hot, too hot for the steel bit and drill pipe, you know, to remain in a, you know, <laughs> uh, stiff condition to continue drilling. So they stop. And there are many theories why they stop. Someone said they heard the cry of devil, the Satan, or whatever it is. So they sealed that well completely with molten iron to some depth and whatever it is. And there is no, maybe one small sign there. So why I'm saying this uh, about uh, uh, going deep and deep uh, in the con uh, context of today's topic is uh, because uh, of our uh, need to continue drilling for sequestration, but uh, better uh, for geothermal. The geothermal is not commercial yet, except a few locations in California. The Australian uh, CSIRO, that a Council for Science uh, Scientific Research, they tried and the government funded, and uh, they got uh, those uh, hot dry rock, which is called granite. Uh, they, but they could not commercialize it, so they have shut down. So America is number one, and then we have the Iceland, for example. But in Iceland, it is not hot dry rock. They are very close to the underground magma chambers. So. And they also have a, a natural aquifer. So they produce from there. Uh, so this is a very interesting subject. And uh, I include that hydrothermal also. But the other one, which was proposed, I mean, massively you know, endorsed by a team of top you know, 18 professor, one eight, in 2006 from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, a 620 page report. And I read it and studied it cover to cover in 2010 because of my interest. And uh, what they said, they give some brilliant and it's a very credible conclusions and recommendations. They say government should put money to drill to reach hot, dry rock and two wells in a pair. One will send water. It will become hot, super heated, if it is, let's say, above uh, 300 degrees Celsius. And the other one will bring it back, super heated water. Who is when you flash it means reduce the pressure a little bit, generates huge amount of steam, high temperature pressure. What a wonderful gift of nature. This is called engineered or enhanced geothermal. I don't like the word which is most commonly used, enhanced. Before they used engineered, it is it needs engineering. So enhanced could be. It's not uh, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, it does have a punch. Uh, so when you make some words and phrase, we should make it to give it a kick. Okay. I love that. So I would say engineer, geothermal, easy as system, engineered geothermal system. Why I'm saying that? Because one way of rebranding is it has immense heat at a depth of about to, to let the how much? Four to five kilometers, not much, or 10 kilometers. So somewhere it is shallow, somewhere it is a little deeper. The shallows are like low hanging fruit, like in California. Also, it is in my home state in Eastern India. 
you know, where the world still has the oldest oil field still producing, Dig Boy, Tinsukia, where there was a blowout last year from May 27 through November 15. And for all those 174 days, my heart was burning. And then my mind got ignited. And I developed a system. I call it two component, semi-autonomous, casing, emergency, shutdown system. What it will do when this guy, blowout preventer, it showed only one RAM, this guy, in my hand, it, it fails to do its duty because of human errors, not its error. It's very heavy, tons, all three of them together. So they need to be handled with care so that there are many components inside. They don't get, you know, rusted or displaced because of bad handling. And I mean that. But... It is just like telling the guys, hey, behave well. So I better put something which does not need their attention. Because this guy is, they call nipple up and nipple down. And carry nipple up, nipple down. So it goes, gets so much hit by the guys. If I am the one in search, I make sure that it is handled like a baby. It's a big guy, big baby, but it, it's good handling and maintenance. Uh, so it has been there for the last 100 years, but still blowout are happening. And it is happening because when it happens, main reason is it is not taken care of. Whether it is BP, British Petroleum, or Exxon Mobil, this story is the same. All right. So... Yeah, I, I'm yeah. so sorry to interrupt you. Have you changed the presentations, the screen, the your slides? No, 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 no. Oh, I'm perfect. because today's the final day, so I'm also integrating, and this integration will give us a product, which is called Geo Energy. I call it rebranding. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Uh, our audience saw that there is a problem uh, with slides. That's why. Perfect. If yeah, it didn't yeah. change, that yeah, everything yeah. is fine. Yeah, Sorry to because, uh, yes. So, I uh, know this is part of my things. And uh, I because they have not seen it, uh, the first screen changing, right? I was just about to change it. But I wanted to, at the same time, bring it to their attention. Because I have not heard anything back from most people. So, that, that is the reason. You know, I'm bringing this. The please read about that concept, which I could patent, but I didn't patent, and I will not patent. And that will come in the last two slides of today's final presentation, okay? So please bear with me. You know, here it is. So the first thing here is, on our journey to rebranding, is let us practice the green fracking. This is the recap that I do in every session, what I presented yesterday. Uh, so I'll just summarize the recap. So these are the facts, two facts that we have to bear in mind about uh, this fracking. It destroys the cement seal behind casing strings in this unconventional. Mostly are also in the conventional. It's a matter of degree, okay? The more in unconventional, a little less in conventional. So the second fact is that the shale oil and gas fracking has become the mother of methane emissions into the, I mean, in this industry. Okay, so mother of methane. Remember the mother of something, you know, mother of bomb, mother of this. So this is, and I'm telling this, I'm not a journalist, I'm not a reporter. I am the one who had been teaching Hydraulic fracturing at uh, Texas Tech University, undergrad, grad, and other places where I have been there in research. And that's why I have come. I know how bad it is. Okay. How bad it is. And as a geomechanics and rock mechanics engineer, yesterday I convinced, I believe, still there will be some cynical, 
uh, so I invite them to point out uh, if they have any objection in saying that not as a matter of personal choice or opinion, but as a hard fact. Okay, so this is the one. So let us practice uh, and the alternatives. If it is bad, then why are the good guys? So yesterday I presented about one good guy, a real green guy, who is, happens to be my invention of 2010, okay? And now I'm a free man, as free as one can be in a democratic country. I am not on the payroll of any university by my own choice. So at this age of my life, 62, I want to now give back to my profession. My profession is what? Petroleum engineering, the energy, the main source of energy. We are still living in the age of oil, which started from roughly 1870. And when Mr. Rockefeller, he made, expanded this oil ex, you know, exploration and production, and then well, that's shale in the 1870s onward, still continuing. The Paris Agreement people, they are doing a commendable job, but they have to drive a car which runs on petrol, they have to fly, and there is no electric aircraft. So they know it. We, we know it, but we all want to move towards a green one. And the green world of energy will not pop up from the sky. The sun is there, shining, smiling in equatorial tropical countries. But we know that we have not mastered that technology, commercially viable, convert solar energy and meet the needs of all people. It is less than 1%. Okay? So in the interim, what we do? We wait with our hand clasps, just like we wait after the blowout happens. Oh, God, save us. Instead instead of thinking, what else could we do beyond those gigantic monster-like uh, blowout preventers? Whether it, it is the deep sea, like in Mekondo, all can do, be very, very smart. The world is moving, nature is moving from big to small and smart. Dinosaurs are gone. They were replaced by monkeys because monkeys are more agile, they are more intelligent. And then we came human beings. Same thing with technology. The first computer, whatever its name was when I was born in 1858, you know, ENIAC or whatever, it could do only addition and subtraction and a little multiplication, but it occupied three big rooms. And now we have like this. So that is the nature's own dictation of which direction to move. So I found, thanks to, I'm sorry it happened in Bagzan, and, but it ignited my mind and I'm giving it free and nobody is talking about it. I sent to all the chairmen at, at uh, Stanford, at my Texas Tech University, uh, uh, and uh, all the in Middle East, uh, King Fahad, Indian School of Mines, no response. I am not hard. It is the same thing like all the times. It will take time before. So I, my attention is on the young guys, those who are still in the university, especially junior and senior, wherever you are. And you are the one future for that. So I'm passing it to you. Uh, that's the very one of the strongest reason I'm here, and I, I will be as you as I move forward. And the other one I didn't mention yesterday was advanced propellant fracturing by Enhanced Energetics Company. It's a company doing its job since 2000. I use shock wave that is created electrically, which is perfectly green, electricity, the ultimate green, and I use that electricity. And this uh, company, I'll show you who they are, this propellant 
propellant is like gunpowder, okay? Gunpowder. So when you use it, you know, in a canister and you fire it, boom, it explodes and gives lots of smoke. But that smoke, or, you know, uh, not smoke, uh, gas, the reaction products, high pressure and some temperature, but that is deep inside the well board. So no problem about that. Only problem is that this is a very controlled substance. The government control is so high, it creates a tremendous amount of logistics. Okay? So it's not easy. But the easiest thing is this one. It uh, looks bad that I'm talking about because it's my invention. No. It, when you study, you will find the same thing. I want to say a little bit about that, advanced propellant factoring. See, I'm putting it by its own merit. I have no share it, you know, in that product. And whatever I did uh, with the help of this tremendous amount of research about uh, advanced plasma shockwave, it was developed where? at the United States Surface Naval Warfare Research Lab, 1988-1993. When I was at Texas Tech 2007, by the time they advanced so far that they started declassifying their reports. And I mentioned that. And I put my hand on that because I had to learn and do something. And when you want to do something, God helps you. And I'm thankful to God for that. And the other one, it is that advanced propellant fracturing. Who did that research? It is the product of US military R&D at the Sandia National Lab. There are five or seven labs now, started with uh, Los Alamos for the, making the first atomic bomb, nuclear bomb, and then there came two others in California, which were the uh, the factories to produce, uh, to build uh, those hydrogen bombs. So those are the surface the most advanced in the world compared to anything, either in the Soviet uh, military research or the US military research or the British military research. They are the front front. So they developed, and the team leader of that was Dr. Robert Schmidt. And uh, he came out, uh, uh, from there, and then he started a company. That company initially was gas gun, and now this. So why I'm saying this? Look at hydraulic fracturing. Who invented that? Nobody. It was not a product of research. By accident, they were pumping acid in a Kansas or Oklahoma in a carbonate reservoir. But that guy, for some reason, forgot and the pump pressure increased. So he should have been fired for not controlling the pump pressure. But before they wrote the pink letter, you know, pink slip, that means you are fired, they had to flow back. They got more oil, more oil. Means that mistake was a blessing under disguise. So that guy has reared it. And Harry Button pick up the idea. And, oh, if you frack more, you'll get more. And that's how it has become gigantic, massive hydraulic fracturing. I call it demonic because it destroys the cement. They don't tell you. Then that becomes the mother of the methane gas emissions from all the worlds. And I have shown in the yesterday's slides with US government statistics, you multiply those numbers by at least 20%. Yeah. Even then, without that, you can see how humongous is the emissions, okay? And that causes one of the main factors of global warming. Those methane released in the atmosphere, mainly from the oil and gas fields, which is our under jurisdiction. But we are intellectual slaves. But we are professors in the US petroleum schools. We are intellectual slaves. We teach students what they want. We need research money to survive as 
perish, publish or perish. So there the boss dictated, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And that now the good time has come because of United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Control. Now the, they're tightening this crew. 1998, first time, you know, like this, came out the Kyoto Protocol. Sign, 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 sign. Then there are other follow-up, Rio de Janeiro, a little bit more tight. But 2016, Paris Agreement, now tightening to the extent those big bosses in the Action Mobile, with due respect, they're crying, ouch! I really want you to laugh. Ows! Suddenly saying, government, give us some money. And with your money and our money, we'll make it $100 billion and we'll sequester. Ask them, have you started pumping CO2? Where is this small company who sells gasoline along the highways, stripes, Google it, they have spent 40. And we have far better ideas to bring this energy out of coal, out of coal bed, methane, out of oil reservoirs, out of gas reservoirs, into hydrogen, which is a carrier. Hydrogen is not a fuel. Keep in mind, I'll ask in the quiz, in the clean energy, you know, vision or the big uh, a major player is called hydrogen economy hydrogen what is the role of hydrogen in this energy scheme you will burn it of course you can burn if you burn hydrogen that means oxygen will be added combustion what do you get water that's a perfect, but we're smarter. That energy or power we'll get is less efficient than if we make this hydrogen does travel through the fuel cell, F-U-E-L fuel cell. It is a demonstrated commercial technology since 1990s. When I was at Ping Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals, the chemical engineering department, like most chemical engineering department in the world, was very, I know, and uh, strong in research. They had faculties who were doing funded research on fuel cell development. One of them was from I IIT Bombay, Professor uh, Slimu Rahman. He did tremendous research there from IIT, Indian Institute of Technology. By the way, I am also a product of IIT. There are several IITs, and one of the recent is, it is the oldest one, uh, Indian School of Mines, but now they have rebranded re it as Indian Institute of Technology, within bracket ISM, which is the legacy name, Indian School of Mines, which was built by the British government in 1926. The model of its own school, the Royal School of Mines in England to develop the technology to for mining, including coal. Okay, so that's a wonderful thing. So hydrogen, the less efficient use of hydrogen to get uh, the energy out of it is to use it as a fuel. But the smart way is to use it as a carrier. Means make it input into hydrogen fuel cell. In the fuel cell, you can put methanol also, you put methane also, methane, but they have some kind of problems. The best is hydrogen. So hydrogen economy means hydrogen is the carrier. All right? So that's the best. And carrier is better because solar energy you cannot carry. Hydrogen, like natural gas, you can carry through pipelines, distribute. There are many other applications. So let me go forward. So here I'm giving you a layman's version 
of the intellectual merit of hydraulic fracturing. It was not developed by scientists. It is only because the oil companies, they want to get more money. They give some money to some departments, you know, like now Colorado School of Mines, they have huge grant uh, for hydraulic fracturing development further, but they're a smart guy. I like them. They say, we are developing it for geothermal because geothermal, one injector well, one producer well, you need them to connect at the basement rock hot. It must be fracked, otherwise this basement rock vessel or it's granite, it has no porosity, no permeability. So unless you fracture them by massive fracturing at that great depth, you cannot make the water flow and get it heated and bring the energy of the earth, heat energy, okay? So they are also smart, I like that idea. But uh, 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 I hope you guys will go with the other idea also for fracturing and this which uh, we're presenting over here, either this plasma, uh, sorry, advanced propellant fracturing or advanced plasma shock fracturing. Uh, before I leave this slide, I want to draw your attention. Why I call advanced here and advanced here? Well, like any business who says potential, once the first one comes, then many other companies come with some nuts and bolts. In propellant fracturing, there are many companies, don't trust them. They are just there to make money. They don't know what they do, they claim shots. But I am giving you this name, Dr. Robert Schmidt from Sandia National Lab. He's still alive. He did his PhD in uh, 1970. And in 71, he joined and at what he left. And in 2000, he started his company in 1992 but it got traction in terms of this advanced research product called the gas gun from that year onward. Still running and he's, he's, he's still alive. So let's move to the next one. So here, yesterday I sent the following message to Dr. Robert Schmidt, okay? He's old and I wanted to share with you uh, because there is a message that shows that I like the shared art model in a, Spirit of cooperation, not competition, and earn money. No, money will follow. I said, hi, let us cooperate to give the world two green fracking technologies and help the energy sector of the society, that is oil, gas, coal, wind, methane, and coal, and geothermal, in developing the fossil energy resources toward a zero greenhouse gas emission endowment of nature, okay? And today I'm talking to you. So I invite you all to join me in the service to the profession and welfare of our future generations on planet Earth. I really mean it. And I can tell you, if you carry this message, to your professors, the old ones, they laugh at you. They say, who said this? He said, uh, you'll say, oh, it is one professor or Dr. Awal and like, oh, he's a crazy guy. Okay, I don't mind that, but don't take their word. Use your own intellect. Thank you very much in advance. So now I'm opening uh, this rebranding. That how are we rebranding? Just change the level? No, I'm not talking about putting and a new wine in an old, old, old bottle, as they say in English proverb, okay? And I'm not changing the level, okay? Uh, and that reminds me to a nice joke widely circulated in India you know, and elsewhere, that there were three engineers, they were traveling in a train or aircraft, whatever it is. I guess it is train because they can sit side by side. All top engineers of their countries, maybe. One was American, one was Japanese, and third one from India, but not top, I'll tell you why. So they uh, started small talk, oh, like this, I'm sorry, oh, like this? Hmm, the American engineer, he said, we have the best engineering technology. 
I'll show you. He opened it and he brought out a needle in a very fine, not needle, fine, still wet, very thin, like a hair. And he said, we have this automatic manufacturing process. We can make it mass production. This is a sample. Can you make it? He challenged the Japanese engineer. He said, yes, please, let me try. So he took it and he opened his briefcase and he had a drill machine and he said, Z -Z 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 -Z. then he gave it. Look, I have drilled a hole through the thin steel wire. How did you do that? And the Japanese said, that is Japanese engineering. And then the Indian, not me, he was a Sardar. They are very lovely people, very hardworking, very ingenious. But of course, at the time when the joke, joke was created in the 1970s, you know, we, India was not known as a future superpower in engineering and science, like space, nuclear, no. He said, let me do one thing. Hey, what you will do? I'll show you. He opened his briefcase, did something, and he said, look what I've done. That American tinware with a hole inside drilled by Japanese, he put a small level there, made in India. <laughs> so I'm not talking about changing the level. Of course, India can do much more, not only in engineering, in science. And I'll show you how it's not through my words. And in, of course, IT, you know it. So actually, what I said here, let's produce hydrogen from the fossil energy, that that is an understatement. Because by fossil, we mean oil and gas. No, we have oil and natural gas, we have coal and coal with methane and also geothermal, okay, energy. And now, why? Before we do anything, why I should do it? Why? Is it bothering us? Yes. It is the impact of the 1992 United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. By the way, you might be thinking that Mr. Awal, Dr. Awal, or whatever it is, Sheikh Awal, you are 62, but you're talking the high voice, not like those professional, you know, like this, this. I don't like that. I'm 62, but inside me, it is 16 years plus, okay? I know someone said it, but I didn't become 16 years, one six inside because of that. I'm always like this, to the extent in my class, whether it's in America, right, in Saudi Arabia, or UAE, if I see student not paying attention, I just say, please leave the room. If you are not excited, then you don't deserve to be here. People say, hey, he's rude like this. I said, no, I'm not rude. He's rude by not pay, paying attention. Of course, I don't mean you, okay? It's not a classroom. So we need to be energetic. And now, well, there's a good reason, but is there an example? By human nature, we need examples. If nobody has done it, why should I? Remember that statement of fact, when I got the first idea in my mind, because I was working for several years, almost a decade on geomechanics and did wonderful things. I'm not claiming those who are received the service of this funded project, they say. I got this idea and my manager carried that idea to the top bosses of that company who funded research. Uh -uh, this is Dr. All is talking too much. If this is true that with shockwave you can do fracturing, how come they have not done it in America? And my manager came back and reported, and he said, sorry. I said, no, don't be sorry. I understand. Probably I would have said the same thing, you know, uh, under that situation or whatever it is. But I'm going to America. 
the, after a couple of months because my daughter has finished high school under uh, under those uh, uh, beauty system in Saudi Arabia called UGSC or something like this. She got six subjects, A star. So her mother promised her, if you can get A star, then we'll take you to America for higher education. And she did it. My wife said, uh -oh, now we have to keep her promise. You apply. So I applied, I got a Montana Tech offer, I got offer from Texas Tech, and my family said, Montana is very cold in the north part. It's a beautiful, very beautiful. I've been there in February, like this, <laughs> like this, so cold. I flew from the desert of Saudi Arabia, not desert, the city of Dharan, you know, hot country. And then Texas was also snowing at the time, February. And they know, through internet, my children, they know, so oh, Texas, Texas detour. So, and rest is history. And believe me, when my invention was disclosed by the vice president of research and technology commercialization at Texas Tech University in 2010, through their web pages described keeping the IP intact, but for commercialized. The first com company that responded to participate and fund was that company which laughed at the idea. How come the Americans have not done it yet? And Dr. Awal is suggesting that. No, this is, he's now just talking too much. So I'm willing to take this laughter. Whoever says, that, oh, this is crazy idea, no problem. Now, good examples. I salute the Stanford University to, for becoming the first to rebrand its you know, undergrad program. It was petroleum engineering. And in 1995 or so, they changed to energy resources engineering. Was it just change of the name? No. They became the front runner of geothermal, both hydrothermal and the hot dry rock. And especially, I salute Professor. Um, uh, he was a professor, he's a professor, and world renowned for his textbook on well testing methods, uh, Professor Roland Horn. And he became the forefront. He didn't say, well, I am a professor of well testing. I don't want to do. He did too, and he and his colleagues. Opportunity, 1993 came, they're very talented mind, and they knew it. We better remain in the forefront of this. And it is around California, in, in Stanford is in California. They know they have lots of geothermal. They said, we, we are the best in drilling in the engineering sector, petroleum engineers. So let us divert our attention and meet the challenges of getting the steam from hot, dry rock. And I should have mentioned there that in 2006, 2006, MIT, who doesn't know MIT? And if there is any other place of higher education and research in the whole world, the first and foremost in my mind, not because people say, no, I know it, it is MIT. And it is not one, not two, not three, not four. 18 professors, they made a panel. They were requested by United States Department of Energy to give their scientific investigative engineer report, not engineering report. What is the potential of hot, dry rock geothermal? They come with 600 pages report in 2006. And I read it, studied it, I, when it is good, I eat good. When it is good kapsa, good biryani, I eat like anything, I munch it. If it's not good, I said, no, mother. So I enjoyed it all the way. 
I made a summary version of that. And before I set sail for UAE, before I joined them, I sent them. By the way, the UAE uh, in Abu Dhabi, they have a Mazdar Institute for Research. You know, very good. And also they have the international headquarter of this renewable energy. So they had a conference, just convened by the university I was going to join. I said, why don't I put my mind there? So I immediately, I took three days, wrote a paper, investigated about the potential of geothermal energy in UAE, the country where American Institute of, uh, American University of uh, uh, Russell Kremel is located. There are other good universities also. So I said, wow, it's a wonderful question. Okay. Uh, I went with a mission. The paper was presented, uh, but then I found that the research infrastructure, it is very limited to a few entities like, you know, Petroleum Institute or Mazdar uh, for uh, other Emirates universities, especially the private one, also not private, mine was dormant, you know, there is no road, there's a road block or whatever. So it is stopped there. So at Stanford, they opened it and they're the champion in this. And now others will join, the sooner the better. Then comes in this 10, 2017, slowly, but good, University of Texas at Austin. You all know the first last several years, this uh, school of petroleum engineering in uh, UT Austin is number one in the of gazer ranking or whatever it is, but it is good. And, but still they are halfway, you see, petroleum and geosystems in the name established, not as bold as these guys in Stanford. I salute them, okay? Now, let me cross the Atlantic in Europe. It has been for industrial, the mother of industrial revolution. And all the great sciences are there in from Western Europe. And so I found the University of Edinburgh. They have a program which I have shown on the day one called the Geoenergy Master's Degree Program. And why I'm, I love this? Because they are most contemporary. See, everything we talk under Paris Agreement is there. Okay, carbon capture and storage then radioactive waste disposal for that they need us drilling okay then energy storage including compressed air heat and hydrogen ah hydrogen okay and extraction unconventional and conventional hydrocarbons see wet and dry geothermal heat this wet means hydrothermal and dry means hot dry rock and sustainable use of water resources. So water is in the circle, so you cannot escape it. It cannot be lopsided. Just like when they started, people started complaining about fracking. And of course, there's lots of hypes about it. Oh, they're taking all the potable waters, you know? And then they, they started funding in the universities. Can you show us how to use this municipal dirty water, how to purify it. And there was a riches for that, you know, forgetting that there are other better ways to extract energy. And subsurface fluid tracing, using you know, all this you know, science things. So the point is here, that the world has been now, the, the world has challenged us under this framework, which is now tightening the news around us. And I love that because uh, we work best under stress. So now there's a stress from the government and you know, who signed this uh, latest uh, 2016 Paris Agreement. So that's good for us. As we know, someone is crying, ouch. So here in this cartoon, this is I generated for you but I have no copyright, I don't put copyright. Use it, I created for you to show the broad picture. 
and showing where we stand, our geo-energy system, I call it, because it has several portfolios, as you know. And this is the main bread and butter of usable, you know, portable energy that we are using every day. Coal, crude oil, natural gas, coal, but within now geothermal is coming. Solar and wind, I wish the day will come when all the energy needs from flying aircrafts to even <laughs> using your tanks and everything will get electricity. Electricity is the final product to be used from various sources. The thing that it can come in a green form only from solar and only from wind, no. They don't know. Who are these? I'm not talking about ordinary people, the journalist or the lobbyist. These big oil companies, even petroleum engineering professors, most of them take a survey. If you tell them, instead of producing crude oil from oil reservoir, as we are taught in reservoir engineering and production engineering, can we produce hydrogen there and bring out the hydrogen and not oil, not methane, not gas? Please ask a professor. But in a polite way, in an inquisitive way, you're a student or a UN engineer in a company, I can maybe ask a crop boss. They may say, then it is them, okay? If you teach them properly, they're like, oh, that's a good idea. Maybe your boss will steal your idea because he knows, ah, he, he can convince his boss, but don't mind. Okay, don't sue him. Oh, that's my idea. I guess we're free. We learned all this knowledge we got from previous people. Do we pay them? No. This is what humanity is. And this ethics and this called this service attitude. They write somewhere, okay? But uh, in practice, it's not there. So I, this is the geoenergy system. And that's what really qualifies us to make, okay? To define the picture of green energy. So here I'm showing that from solar, we take electricity, solar energy, okay? And that will use, for example, in methane, to convert methane into hydrogen. There are several processes. One is called the methane pyrolysis. Okay. Or, of course, solar cannot give us all the energy. So we can get from wind. And wait a minute. Why you have to buy only from those? We can install in the oil and gas fields and coal fields solar panels ourselves. Huge amount because we have big oil companies or national oil companies like Saudi Aramco or in uh, Oil and Natural Gas Corporation of India or Oil India Limited or Petrobras. We make enough solar energy for our this conversion of hydrocarbon on surface plants to begin with. Okay. By methane pyrolysis. And we have surplus. We sell it to the electric grid. We make money. Again, two in one. Shooting two parts with one. You make money. Same thing with wind. We can, these big companies have billions, trillions of dollars in their hand. They can invest in wind energy in the oil field. There's no people living there. Get that electricity for converting, starting with methane, it is easiest to convert methane to hydrogen through an, in a non-oxygen environment called pyrolysis. It is proven, it is commercial, okay? And then this hydrogen, first I mentioned about blue hydrogen, which is now they are thinking that we can, that we use the other process called steam, methane, uh, steam, methane reforming. 
it's all 100 year old uh, technology proven that you put steam and uh, methane gas together on catalyst, not in the lab, in the industrial plants, you get the output product. One is hydrogen, other is CO2. Okay, take this CO2, sequester it, then that gas, which is hydrogen, we call it blue hydrogen, okay, which is perfectly green energy. Now, the other one is I'm suggesting orange hydrogen. Now, if you read all the literature in the world, from Stanford to MIT, you'll, you'll not find anywhere this orange hydrogen because I created this term, orange hydrogen. And what is orange hydrogen? That instead of using either methane pyrolysis reaction in surface plants, big plants, or steam methane uh, reforming, okay, in surface plants and making hydrogen and CO2 and inject that CO2 in deep wells to earn this level, blue, blue hydrogen, I can convert, I can make the reservoir itself into a plant, cross media. Now, is it my dream? No, it is also proven, okay? So, especially starting with hydro, the natural gas, natural gas reservoirs, which contains lots of hydrogen sulfide. So it is not commercial. Like in the EOE, they have lots of natural, natural gas reservoirs in Saudi Arabia also, but it contains high amount of H2S. So now one retired professor of King Fahd University he said to me when I was a graduate student doing my master's there in 1985 87. You know, uh, he was a professor, very respected, and one of the top and most uh, chemical engineering expert in the world. He was a professor because King Fahd University they still hire the best from the world, okay? They still do. But in the meantime, they have trained uh, a brilliant batch of. So the scientists and engineers, they have become professors. So two is better than one. And that's how they became number one, you know, in the whole. And someday if they continue the momentum, you will hear their name with the same respect as MIT, Stanford, and Harvard, okay? Or UT Austin, all right? So anyway, so I said, we can do that. How do I know? Now, the other, the professor, Sayyid Farooq Ali, most senior and most renowned in the world in thermal oil recovery, number one authority in the world. And we started this in our graduate program, thermal oil recovery by combustion. That is basically if you put steam, okay, inside the inject and uh, create a high temperature by burning it uh, at the sand phase. So we are basically creating steam, methane, if it is. Uh, it has lots of dissolved gases, which is to be mainly methane. Steam methane deforming. It's this little tweaking. And has done, someone done that tweaking? Okay. So there is a research, one man, two person research professor, uh, two professors from University of Calgary, just north of me in Canada. And uh, Professor Ian Gates, I A N. G A T E S, very sweet person. I've not met him. So they have done a real research R&D with government or company funding. And two years ago, they started a startup company with a private, you know, uh, person coming with some fund. So they want to convert this heavy oil into hydrogen with the same process. Okay. So now, Professor. Uh, from a retired professor from King Fahd University. His name is Professor Hussein Abdel Al. And he has established a research center in Cairo, Al Qahira, my audience from Egypt and Middle East. Please visit him. Visit him. He has a research center, advanced research center for this hydrogen. And do you know which part he's hitting? 
he has demonstrated the, the, the method how to convert that heavily, you know, uh, S two S quantum, you know, you know, uh, natural gas with high amount of S two S in zero power. How to change that to hydrogen? Bring that hydrogen out. What else you can ask for? I look for knowledge God gives me, and then I try to propagate with my hands raised to show my tribute to those. Professor Farooq Ali, the classic expert. We have Professor Hussein Abdul Al. We have Professor Ian Gates, and there could be others, but these two are the three I'm actively following. So now it is time to bring this existing, proven, commercialized technology, I call it technology ready, to the classroom. Now our old professors will not do it. So you have to do it. You demand. We want a course. Like I demanded from the current SPE president, Professor Thomas Blasingame. I wrote to him through LinkedIn that this is what I do then. And he's very nice. He politely replied, yes, we have already created a hydrogen cell or hydrogen committee, which is good for SPE. But I didn't tell him, I'm watching. Don't just meet and waste your time. Do something. I asked him, why don't you suggest this academic program? He said, no, SPE does not have mandate to do that. Why not? Why can't you create an advisory body? If the Paris Convention some energetic scientists, engineers, they can convince the United Nations and UN convinces the, all the governments. Why can't you? You have to play the same game? Oh no, it's not my job. Do it. And I keep sending all this to him also. And I guess he's too much busy being SPD e president. Oh, I have to be there. I have to be there. I think first do the work as a real sincere petroleum engineer or scientist, look, and there's good examples from Western form. By the way, Professor Tom Blessingham is from Texas A&M. Very good, number two, I think, or, or number three in petroleum engineering education. You know, I don't believe in those kind of QS ranking, personally. My thing is, where is the meat? Where is the meat? Laham. You were already late. You too, Austin. You woke up partially. Ah, oh, clear the okay, petroleum and geosystems. Stand up. So that's why I saluted uh, Stanford University, their uh, energy research engineering. And I am writing so many letters to the chair. The current chair happens to be my classmate, Amdi Jalabi from Jordan, and he did his BS at King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals, number one, top rank, number the best student, and he joined the master's program there. I was already one year into that, so he became a classmate, and I know he is a brilliant. So before he finished his master's, I finished with surfactant polymer flooding simulator, I developed from scratch using Fortran 88 or whatever at the time without taking the simulation course because I wanted to know what simulation is and why I didn't take simulation course because other students, they are scared, oh, simulation, no, 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 don't take it. So there's a professor, actually a brilliant professor, Dr. Habib Benoit. I said to him, when you're working this school, but no, we don't have a student coming. You're the only one. Two years, one and a half year I waited, then I said, forget it. I'll do it myself. I didn't tell him. I studied a book, the best book in similar simulation to write how to uh, understand the partial differential equations, how to make them linearized, everything. Dr. Henry B. Krishlo. 
He was a chair at the time of University of Oklahoma, Norman. And there was another book by Professor Khalid Aziz. Uh, I had that book. And uh, also in 1960 or 65, uh, Rush, uh, Rushford, or uh, Rush, I forgot the name. But the best book, if you want to really understand and write code yourself, is as of today, that 1978 book written by Dr. Henry B. Krishlow. Not the XPE textbook. Believe me, when I joined Texas Tech University, they gave me lots of startup fund, and also the department was and is generous to support faculties. I bought all those SPE textbook series. Too many cooks spoil the soup. No structure, no organization. They are not textbook, except one, which is well testing by Professor John Lee, number one best reserves. Drilling is a mess. Reservoir engineering is good, but it could be better. And when it comes to production engineering, I guess a group of handymen joined together and they wrote those. Huge thick books. Quantity. Where is the quality? And so that's my point. You cannot advise the academic institutions to come up, grow, modernize the curricula, and you volunteer to write textbooks and you produce. And the worst book is simulation, reservoir simulation. That was by three authors, one from Canada, one from UAE. That's the worst kind of, so I just trusted. I said, go back, find out. So I ordered Amazon, one old copy I got to show to my students in class. By the way, in undergrad course, simulation, you don't have to learn how to write a simulator. If your professor, is teaching you, he said, this is in the curriculum, that's a 1970s curriculum. And that's what I found at UAE University Petroleum, which was passed to American University of Russell Khaimah. I said, I cannot cheat you. I'll give you the best. You have to use the industry standard top notch built for purpose, modern server simulator. No, don't write code. Don't reinvent the wheel. If you join the company in reservoir engineering department, simulation, they'll not ask you to write code. Undergrad, do you know how to use Eclipse? Not this. I love better the other one by this Russian uh, company, you know, T Navigator. Go for it. But to learn in the classroom, which I did, is $10 million software called Patrick. Patex IPM 11 from Edinburgh, England. And that company was set up by, do you know who? By one Egyptian engineer. I salute to him. I wrote to him, his company, Petroleum Experts Limited, Edinburgh. Nice reply. They asked some questions and they granted the license. Said, please ask your president of the university, that they have to acknowledge this on the website of the university permanently. We have given academic license for free and it's worth is $10 million. And those of you who are attending, tell others what Professor Awal taught. It has a 3D reservoir simulation program. I used it for water flooding. I used it for EOR. I used it for even for drilling. And they have this production, it's called IPM. It is Integrated Production Management, okay? Wonderful. They have this nodal software called Prospar, Prospar, and Surface Pipeline, you know, from Wellhead. All the Wellhead's pipeline goes to Central Processing Plant. So Surface Pipeline, uh, it's called GAP. Everything we taught, beautiful. And I integrated those things with the curriculum. Curriculum means what syllabus? I trust it. The one be before me who taught, 
he bought up those old books, right equations, Thomas algorithm. I said, oh my God. I did like this in imitation of Dr. Uh, Aziz Ode in O-D-E-H, the famous expert of reserve simulation in mobile oil company, which has now joined uh, with Exxon and Exxon Mobil. In 1987, he was invited by King Fahd University uh, for a seminar about his simulation experience. He presented the seminar. It is the one of the most memorable in my mind. In Arabic, it's called Aziz Aula. I learned it, but in English, he writes Aziz Ode, most respected in reservoir engineering and simulation. Do you know what he said? Oh, simulations. What they have done to simulators? He means the company engineers who don't know partial equation. They are trained to fix some nuts and bolts in simulator called history matching. Oh, change porosity here, this grid, empty here to match history. That's like putting a monkey before a typewriter and asking him to write a poetry. Give him banana, the monkey will do all the buttons of the typewriter. And what will come out? Someone calculated that it will take 14 million years for a monkey to continue. And there is a chance a 40 line poetry will come out. 14 million years. So he invented the word garbage in, garbage out. Gigo. Gigo. So in the broader spectrum of petroleum and mining and all these things, don't teach the students what you learned 10 years ago. What is your contribution? You are going back. You're taking us back in time. Don't do that. It is immoral. It is unethical. And students, I got fear as education because the government university, but in this country and most countries, even now my country, original country, uh, my India, they have the church, they take tuition money from students. So it is your right. Take these slides. Ask me to give you the PowerPoint. I'll give you the PowerPoint by email. Show them that if you, what are these and what are you teaching? Why are you not changing? Now there's two grand excuses. One is, oh no, 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 we cannot send syllabus because we have already gotten ABET accreditation, A-B-E-T. We are good. You are not good. And the others will say, oh, we are big enough. We don't care for ABET. We have our own tradition, our own name sales. Tell them, how long? U-N-F-C-C. Tell them to spell it out. And tell them it is now Paris Convention. And next time, God knows what will happen. But you and I, you the new generation, current generation, and I, we are not supposed to wait until somebody tells us. We run for knowledge, and knowledge is there. Just like sun. If you go out of your house, you get the sun. Knowledge, take the keyboard. Yes, you'll play some games, but do the work first. That's what I do. That's how I read about 606 pages of MIT report and all those things, plus what they are doing in Calgary. And now when there is a blowout, these petroleum engineers, they joined and said, hey, whom to blame? Oh, you didn't do I said, look, there could be 1,001 reasons why there will be blowout. But the question is, now it is on fire. How can you put up this fire? Not wait for six months and save ourselves, our society? Oh, what could they do? Some Americans, Germans, they built the blood preventer. We are not better than that. Come on. You are 
downgrading yourself. So please, my time has come to close it after this four days. All I'm trying to do is that I'm not addressing these old people. I sent them anywhere. No one has gone. They'll think I'm crazy. But I really request you that please ask yourself, does it make sense? You have to study science. You have to study engineering. And you know the contemporary world. Clean energy, environment. Ask yourself. So these hydrogen fuel, say, uh, uh, blue hydrogen, whether it is orange, near future, hopefully, and blue hydrogen, already it's possible at surface, provided you also inject in the uh, deep formations, the CO2 that will be a byproduct of this, uh, your steam uh, methane reforming, then it, it becomes, so it becomes an energy carrier, not fuel. And uh, uh, it goes to hydrogen fuel, because fuel cell is the entity and hydrogen goes inside it as a carrier of energy. And what energy? Electricity. And from this side, again, that you'll be producing uh, from oil reservoirs, gas reservoirs, okay, in situ. Not bring them to the surface and then convert them. Then it will become blue hydrogen and obviously more, uh, more expensive. But if you can do it, and is everywhere, and you can by modifying a little bit, advancing or customizing the thermal recovery method using those combustion and steam injection both. You need temperature, so combustion, you need steam, yes, it will react with the methane or it will break the ethane into methane and it will do steam, methane reforming, which is a proven technology and commercial technology. But it happens this time in the reserve world. Why? Because the byproduct will be CO2. The CO2 will remain there. Why it will remain? Because at the production well bore, you put a call, they call it membrane selective. That particular, that membrane technology, if you put that liner, and this again, commercial technology, just like you use membranes for desalination of uh, seawater. So the salt remains one side of the membrane and pure water comes. And that's you are drinking in Cairo, in Dharan, in most places in the Middle East, uh, near the sea countries. Even in Riyadh, they have jewel plant and other places uh, and go through big pipelines to transport desalinated water to Riyadh and other places, okay? So similarly, the membrane separation, it is not uh, in the lab, it is in the commerce. So you produce hydrogen. I'll ask questions so that you can have a clear picture. Uh, and I'll also set it up in such way that you remember instantly. So this is the new picture. So the situation in terms of the demand for clean energy in terms of tech, technology, readiness, technology readiness, we are there. All we need is our willpower. Big companies, we don't care for them, but it should begin from home, which means the academia, okay? And let us see what else I have. So here I have just given a note, blue hydrogen. It is produced at surface process plants well-developed technology, and its feedstock is methane. But the methane will be converted into hydrogen and CO2. That CO2 you have to inject in carbon sequestration in a process by spending money, not getting any return, but you get the level of that you're clean. You are not a culprit in, uh, in global warming process. You get a level, blue hydrogen. So if there's any carbon tax, you'll be exempted from carbon because you are paying that money instead to creating the infrastructure for carbon sequestration. Now, orange hydrogen, it is produced at subsurface reservoirs, okay? And its feedstock is oil and natural gas. Natural, I'm sorry, the L is there. Uh, I need to send my keyboard. I bought it for 20 dirhams from UAE. 
So I need to send it um, uh, for some more money. And it will be hopeful in the near future. How I know? Because this process is well known, because the membrane separation technology is there. And then they have started. Uh, I will mention two names Professor Hussein Abdul Al. Those of you in Cairo or those of you in other places, please make an intellectual pilgrimage, intellectual pilgrimage to visit his research center in Cairo and let me know. And tell that if it is because of my request, you go convey my salam, my respect to him, okay? And tell them that when I was doing master's at Kingford University of Petroleum and Minerals, we had a graduate master's course in petroleum economics. That book was his book, and that was the best petroleum economics book. I thought, how come Professor Hussein Abdullah Al? He is a professor of chemical engineering. See, we need a professor like that. Professor Hussein Abdullah Al. Even at Indian School of Mines, undergrade, from 1978 to 1983, we had a semester course. In the final year, we had petroleum economics. And one of our two textbooks, one of that book, Hussein Abdul Al, he was the second author. And the first author was one Robert something. So our professor was Dr. Tarakashar Kumar, T. Kumar at the time. He was an associate or assistant professor of petroleum engineering. Just hardly sub two years. He taught us petrol, petrol economics, very beautiful. Uh, double entry bookkeeping, which is a matter of accounting, he taught us very well. And my uh, 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 tribute to him. And when he, he used to mention about petrol, petrol economic books, he'll mention only the first author, Robert something. Or Chilean, uh, no, I'm sorry. And the second, I said, that, that's another name. Who's it? <laughs> okay. But anyway, when I joined uh, for my master's, uh, uh, after having spent two years, uh, one and a half years at ONGC Bombay after project, and I had the best experience to learn about well construction, uh, really. And all this, this my, if you would like to call it invention, that two component casing emergency shutdown system, it won't be possible, not that practical knowledge because I used to install those sub-surface controls, sub-surface surface but I know everything about it and how to make it even better. But that was the golden opportunity I got. And my colleagues at ONGC, they are beautiful. I always like to tell who was the best professor, but I also like to tell in my life, who was the best manager, engineering manager. That manager was in Bombay High, you know, from, Oil and Natural Gas Corporation at the time commission, he was engineer B. D. Malhotra, Bhagavan Dutt Malhotra, most brilliant engineer and manager. Believe me, he had hundreds of employees under him. He was the chief engineer. He knew the name of everybody. So he comes, you know, once a month to tour the offshore platforms. He comes down from the helicopter and meets us in the mess and, or in the alley. Hey, Rafik, how are you? And then in the office, he's the leader from behind and he's the best of all time in my life, 62 years. And I also mentioned one professor. I have seen professor in India, professor in Middle East, professor in America in my undergrad my master's and my PhD programs, you know, my, my studies. And the best one really, really is uh, for Professor Muhammad, Muhammad Agur, M.A. Agur. Uh, uh, the chairman uh, is to tell him, oh, he's Ajur, but in Egypt, the Agur, okay. he's the best. Oh, I enjoyed, I used to wait to attend his class. And also he inspired me to write the first Fortran program to implement Orkizewski's correlation. I did it. And he gave me a pat on my back. You did it. 
Do you know what he did? He was a colleague of Orkizewski in Esso, Canada. And his colleague, he brought out one printout of those pressure tra traverse curves. He said, you print your, in, in those days printer 1987, 86, 86, on the same scale, X and Y. And I did print it and he put them on top of each other with the light and they are messing very closely. He said, that on my bag. And that was the best reward so far I had received among others. A professor, when he pats on your bag, that means a lot. And he's still alive. He has retired now. He's now in, I think, somewhere in Texas. Uh, I know him only through LinkedIn. Uh, so if you meet him, uh, tell him uh, my regards and what I, he means to me. Okay. So now let us move a further. Uh, there, I know most of you from the Middle East. Uh, I'm sorry you have to go for Iftar, but do come back again when the YouTube version is released, okay? Uh, a little bit about blue hydrogen and orange hydrogen. And I believe orange hydrogen is the smart guy more than this. Because here, for this carbon capture and sequestration, you have to put your money down, high capital expenditure to create those wells and those, those pumps and everything and pipelines and OPEX, operating cost. But you don't sell that product. It goes uh, deep inside the earth, so it don't make money. You just use money. For example, you know, our friend, Oxygen Mobile has announced they'll spend $100 billion. I don't know how much of that will be from US government because that's called economic stimulus. I uh, will know that. And the other one that I, you know, I thought, and I gave a name, orange hydrogen, because I'm a petroleum engineer, undergrad, master's, PhD. So at least in master's and PhD, I studied thermal oil recovery twice, undergrad once, three times. And of course, I want to go beyond that. Then I said, let me review the literature. I Googled it, but oh no, Professor Ian Gates at University of Calgary, he's already suggesting. I was not sad, I was happy. Wow, wow, at least there is a leader, you know? So I stopped this connection with him through email. And then last week I found Professor Hussein Abdul Al, and he's even a much bigger guy, you know? He's the king. Professor Ian gets with respect, he's a prince, but Professor Hussein Abdul Al. He's no less than you know, Professor Ahmed Jawil, the Nobel laureate, or APJ Abdul Kalam of India, or Professor Satish Dhawan in India in chemical engineering, because Professor Hussein. I'm amazed that he, at this old age, maybe 80 years, is running a research center and doing credible research. Not to get some, you know, name. He doesn't need a name to give the world. He said this in city conversion of, and especially he picked up the sour gas. So the Arabia is rich in gas, but they cannot produce. You know, uh, they already have problem with the sulfur in the oil. By the way, I'll ask a question. I have not read it here. In the quiz, that's the all the kind of those countries which produce crude oil. Okay, whose crude oil has the highest amount of sulfur? Answer is Saudi Arabia. How much? From ten thousand to twenty thousand ppm parts per million. But can you send that to refinery? No, it will poison the catalyst. So before they send this crude oil to the refineries in Rasal, uh, Ras Tanura or in Jubail, okay, or the other one is uh, Yanbu, they have to do processing in the field to, to remove that salt, oh, sorry, sulfur. 
It's a huge amount, 20,000 ppm. They have to bring down to maybe 100 ppm or 50 ppm. So they send that crude oil for refinery, which is good, but they extract the sulfur and they, you know, at one time it is to make like artificial sand dune, yellow sand dune, so much because they produce millions of barrels, but they did a credible job, you know, they continue. But then when it comes to gas, they don't produce it because uh, gas price is not that high. Uh, but now if they apply Professor Hussein Abdullah Al's method that in the porous media, how you can convert that foul, sour, natural gas into pure hydrogen and produce through the wells. Man, it is time to wake up, but res respect him and invite him and give him a free hand to stop this. It's good for you. Okay, and this much I can say to you with due respect. Hope it will go to the right ear. If you're old, honorable, then I ask the young engineers in Saudi Arabia. Okay, so please do it for your country and for humanity. So now, uh, this is one more, uh, just an explanation. But on the side now, what is my contribution? Okay. I said, besides those conventional oil and gas, of course, they're not uh, allowed to apply this uh, in situ uh, hydrocarbon to hydrogen conversion technology through a combo, a combined uh, uh, technology of uh, in situ combustion and steam injection. But I say, and, and then Professor uh, Hussein Abdel Al, probably he also knows that. So he has said, how about the unused, you know, the high S2S content, sour gas is everywhere. And then I put one idea here more. This is for my, I said, how about the abandoned oil fields? They contain 50, you know, 50 to 70 percent of the original oil in place. So think about that. In this way, they are not owned by anybody now. They're abandoned and they're shallower. They're shallower because initially when Colonel Edwin Drake drilled, it was 69 feet. And then low hanging fruits are gone. They drill deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And, deeper. and at the time there was no such thing as enhanced electric, no, uh, the water flooding, it came much later. So, Let's say up to 1950, the reservoirs all over the world in India, Burma, Indonesia, you know, then in Europe, Russia, and of course, number one in the United States of America, and then Venezuela, and all, and Mexico. All those abandoned fields, they are the low, lowest hanging fruit. They are shallow. That means you have to drill on the shallow, how much? 1,000 foot to 2,000 feet. Wow, and inject what? Inject steam a little bit, okay? Or if you don't want, use Professor Hussein Abdullah's, okay? It was just uh, 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 whatever uh, he suggested, do that. And what you're doing, you are reinventing the old and they are more in number. Much more oil is still locked in those abandoned fields than the now, uh, amount of oil in the known reserves waiting to be lifted, okay? So this is a wonderful thing. So forget about the peak oil theory. Those are dense, 1970. That's lack of vision, just playing with statistics, statistics, okay? There's a joke, very serious joke. I think Mark Cohen or whoever said that. There are three kinds of lie. Lie, Damn lie, D-A-M and damn lie. And number three, statistics. I repeat, it's a serious joke by a wise man. I don't know who it is, most probably Mark Twain. White, mustache, you know, famous guy, I love him. He said, there are three kinds of lies. Ordinary lies, lies, the damn lies, the swear and the lie. But even worse than that is called statistics. 
Now, statistics has a two things, good things and bad things. And bad thing is unnecessarily putting data together and giving something false picture at the peak oil theory, okay? Now, how, why I say this is my contribution abundant oil fields. 2009, I had a brilliant student who came here from Indian School of Mines, my alma mater. And I liked him. I gave him assistantship, research assistantship. And I gave him an idea. This is my idea. I, and he had a very good experience of reservoir simulation. He worked at Institute of Reservoir Studies or in, in Masana oil field of India, Western India, uh, operated by uh, the National Oil Company, ONGC. And he became an expert in running simulator, this eclipse or whatever. I said, look, I have a simulator by a Canadian farm. It's called Exodus. It's for black oil, it's for thermal. So use the black oil, I, and I got a free academic license from 10 associate. And I like it because Professor Farooq Ali, his student under his supervision developed it and made a startup company and he endorsed it. And I found his endorsement more than what he thought to be brilliant for academic studies. So I set up the whole problem for him to look, revisit, uh, recreate, let us simulate the abundant oil fields. Because in the abundant oil fields, they're abundant because why? Because they are not a single drop of oil. No, 50 to 70 percent still there. But the production rate went down below 10 barrel per day. In those days, before 1960, that was not commercial. So they shut down. Now, we are reservoir engineers. We know what happens, called gravity segregation. So from 1960 or 1950, <coughs> now, that was the year 2008, that has been enough time for the free gas, who has got free, in the process of flow of the oil from porous media, at the edge, it comes towards the production well, the pressure decreases and gaps come out, right? So th those gas should now go slowly up and make a secondary gas gap. And the oil should go down. Of course, they are down, but they'll go further down. What does it mean in terms of saturation? The now this those old reservoirs, okay, abandoned for the last 50, 60 years, you have a distinct transition zone. Top part is only gas, which was liberated from the oil during that production life of 20 years or whatever it is. Now they are up because of gravity segregation and below oil. The oil saturation will increase, right? Yes. So if the oil saturation below now increases, what will happen to its relative permeability? It will increase. And if the relative permeability increases, what will happen to the productivity index? It will increase. That means if you just open those wells at the surface, initially you'll get some hissing sound, then oil should start flowing. More than 10 barrels per day, commercial. Of course, nowadays, if it is one barrel per day, at the time it was $100 per barrel. It, Professor Awal, it's a wonderful idea. I'll do it. So I invite him to my home after dinner. I take my laptop. I set it up. I said, have you used this software before Exodus? No, sir. So I'll show you. It is easier than what you have handled. If you've done uh, the big guy, Eclipse, this is nothing for you. But everything just lining up. And in one day he mastered it. And I said, make a run like this, run like this. After one week, he came smile at me. Professor, exactly the results are as you told me. And he showed me graphs. Wow. And how much we put the data that it was stopped at 10 barrel per day. Now, after this dormant period of 50 years, we call it Time lapse, time lapse. I invented the terminology. I like that. Time lapse segregation under gravity. So it's showing now 80 barrel per day. 
Did you hear what I said? That it has shut down when the production rate went down to 10 barrel per day and they thought it was not economical anymore. Now, 50 years after that, I open it up. Do you know how much it shows? 10 barrel per day. Is it for one day or two day? I said, because simulation we run for years, it showed that it can produce above 10 barrel, you know, from 80 barrel, and slowly it will start declining for another 15 years. So we ran again and again, making sure we didn't do mistake. Change for oil properties, PPD properties, change porosity, change permeability. We get a very beautiful picture, as the theory told us, gravity segregation. See? Now you'll see, oh, that's really easy. How come I did not think about that? Like I made these two components, semi-autonomous pressing valve. If you think, you'll see, it is so easy. But someone has to think about it with the fundamentals of knowledge, with trust in your knowledge. If you worked hard, you know you trust yourself. So I'm again inviting you. I'm a little bit disappointed, but not angry, that I didn't get any response for email from anybody. Of course, I have reason to be angry. How come you don't put a comment? Tell me that it is wrong. I like that. Nothing, no response. That is irresponsible. I don't like someone coming here to be a better only a piece of paper. You should earn it. My PhD certificate, it came in a big cylinder. It's still there. I didn't frame it anywhere. I don't want to show to the world in my office at Texas Tech University or in uh, American University of Khaima. I never put my PhD certificate on a frame. I never framed it. There is absolutely no need. Do I tell myself that my name is Rafik Awa? Or I tell my wife, hey, I'm your husband. Rafik Awa is speaking. I know myself. And at least you should be able to read and criticize. If you don't read and you have done anything, you will be just a burden, or they call it in America, you sucker. It sounds bad, but that's what it is. Don't be a sucker. Contribute. And I'm giving it free. I could pretend. How I do? No. This abandoned oil field, that research my student did, we looked at the time, because university, when it, they say you have to get IP to lock the thesis, that thesis was locked, embargo. So nobody can, only during the presentation, whatever he presented before the committee and the student, that's it. If you want to get, want to get a copy, no. University has a copy, but they'll not give you. Just the entering database, no. And I forgot to remove that. You know, embargo. So I contacted uh, my students who work in several oil companies in Houston. Then he got some bright ideas. He said, this oil price goes up and down. And I fear, I don't, I don't want to buy a thousand dead because of fear of oil price and losing my job. He went to India. He started his private business in Bangalore and he's rising. It is not in petroleum engineering. But he's shining as a, he's the CEO of his oil own company, just two years old. And he's opening branches all over India. <coughs> so I told him that please write a letter because since it is his thesis, he has to write to the graduate school to remove that embargo. Uh, so even I cannot access, uh, I have the hard copy, I have the everything, hard copy, <coughs> but I wanted to show it to you. I said, I want to give to the whole world. At the time, three companies came flying because before we locked it for a one week, it was open for two weeks. Three companies came flying from Houston to my university, venture capitalists. They want to get a license for the idea. <coughs> and immediately we locked it. Because I don't want this venture capitalist, you know, uh, to spread. I want someone big companies. But then I got even a bigger invention, which is plasma shock, much bigger. So I got excited for a positive reason. I forgot about that. So now that time has come. 
to rejuvenate abundant oil field, not to produce as predicted by my simulator, but now use them as the lowest hanging fruit available for you. Most of you are uh, probably gone on IFTA, but please, organizers, Professor Ahmed Algari, and also my uh, this coordinator, uh, Rahima uh, Babayev, please take a note about this, okay? And I want you guys to get that thesis. And I also have the master's thesis about this plasma that I released in 2015. And then I told Professor Soliman and that famous scientist, my colleague, ex-colleague, Dr. Wayne House, the main person brain behind creating the hardware we call MRI. It is him, okay? And that look, guys, I have now removed that uh, embargo. I heard you have a student, uh, one from Turkey, one from uh, China, both ladies, girls. And Professor Wellenhouse said, you have not released it, so they don't know, I don't know, nobody knows, but that, and we know it's potential, but we're scared of using that equipment. 20,000 fold, you told us, when he defended his thesis. And 70,000 MPR. I am afraid that girl would get shocked. Uh, so I released that, and immediately uh, they picked up, and they took two years time, because I was not there, I was in Conrad Clips. And, uh, and uh, once you are in an oil company, you cannot talk to outside the world without permissions, okay? And uh, they thought, because I wrote that he's in such a way, I asked him that, I dictated and he wrote uh, that anyone with serious mind will be able to understand in a very scientific methodical way, step by step, and why, why we did that. Not that we did this, we got this. No, after every experiment, we will not stop thinking. I do thinking and I discuss with him. And say, now we should do some more experience, either to confirm or contradict uh, about the possibilities. So that is a very systematic approach. I want you to have it, okay? And if I have some students from Indian School of Mines, now called this IIT, uh, I would ask you, you know, to even put more things on that. So I'm very close, uh, almost. So what we have now, we have a geo energy system, which is based on the cleanness from hydrogen that becomes the carrier of energy, which is called to give the world electricity, the fuel cell technology, okay? And it is uh, from where, as we've seen, I'm summarizing, oil and gas reservoirs, the abundant oil fields, my humble contribution, coal bed methane reservoirs, then underground coal gasification. Uh, maybe there is some more. Geothermal, I didn't put it. Uh, 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 maybe I should put geothermal also. And then with this, what should I do? Now let us do something. First step, as I said, to bring this idea on a single platform and introduce a cross, as a cross-disciplinary curriculum, okay? Uh, involving this resource basis, plus uh, 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 the uh, geothermal, okay? And that will create what we call geoenergy engineering. I'm talking about universities, undergraduate and master's level. So let us put geoenergy engineering based on this. You see, this belongs to first one, to petroleum engineering, current and classical, no, Stanford does doesn't care, and uh, and the UT Austin, number one in petroleum engineering, they're hesitant, 50-50. Uh, uh, then abundant oil field. This is my humble contribution. The coal bed methane it is 50% we mining, uh, coal, uh, coal and 50% uh, our technology of direction drilling, you know, and injecting CO2 for enhanced methane production from coal bed. And then underground coal distribution, 100% coal. Coal is still the king, but the king has lost its throne. The throne is captured by oil and gas the last uh, 120 years, okay? And now it is almost going to be abandoned, but please don't do that. This underground, you know, more than 1,000 feet below, huge resource bases there. We can gasify 
by drilling and this is as simple as one to three okay and that is of course geothermal and with that geo energy engineering is going to be the king what happened to solar and wind they maybe they'll become king after 100 years this is my gut feeling i don't care what us energy admission tells or the un or those top big experts in action mobile those makes no sense to me the way the technology of solar conversion is progressing you know and also the wind uh, it tells me that the world is not ready uh, to depend on that 100% in the interim maybe for one and even after that when they become but still you will need this oil and gas and coal for one good reason 90% of the oil and gas we burn and 10% we turn them into petrochemical so petrochemical will will still need and the population will be more so there will be huge demand for oil and gas and the coal one good reason i give you i am from india and people they like to take thin uh, you know what do you call it uh, we call it roti chapati chapati means thin flat bread and it tastes best when you use a coal or charcoal oven because of the gas that permeates through it as a flavor for that reason people export from the coal fields over 1000 miles in trucks coal because somebody is willing to buy it and is a pretend for that purpose so there is always market for that uh, but i'm not meaning that is the only market because energy demand is so high china is king in coal india is also especially the lignite you know which is the dark brown color one it has a huge uh, and also the us and of course you know england russia they all have so if we know how to convert those carbons whether pure carbon or hydrocarbon into methane uh, i mean into hydrogen and we have seen that yes then you tell me which way the wind will blow and so we need to have now we are, we are talking in the university context to have a multidisciplinary program called geo energy engineering one example is university of aberdeen they are giving masters but it should start with undergrad and the petroleum engineering coal engineering i don't say mining coal engineering geothermal engineering chemical engineering and mechanical engineering they should all contribute to this portfolio of uh, academic program on a multidisciplinary platform and the program them have said it is uh, ultimately generate hydrogen so i call there should be a brotherhood among all this engineering that should be bonded together with the vision of hydrogen bond and what we have energy research institute to go beyond that because once we do it academy and we should also put research there you know all right energy research institute so like king fahad university has its own research institute and stanford has it and texas ut austin uh, has it but it's better that the lead in this energy development clean is taken in terms of technology development on this platform multidisciplinary research platform uh, bonded together among this with hydrogen fission the mechanical uh, i've shown at the bottom but they should be at the top why i have not put that example but if you go to ut austin they have, a, they have an energy research center and that is mainly under uh, the control of the ideas of mechanical engineering professors but they invite all other chemical such like this and they are doing wonderful in promoting the you know and in demonstrating and commercializing this hydrogen economy okay as a career so this last couple of slides i have uh, this suggestion that i'm going that what we can do what i can do i am trying everywhere 
Now, last week I got connected with some young students, junior and senior at the Indian School of Mines, my alma mater. It was established in 1926. And in uh, 2018 or so, it was renamed as Indian Institute of Technology within bracket, the abbreviation ISM. So this is the 1926 building it's still there. And there are so many other buildings, beautiful, in a nice, you know, elevated, just like Lubbock, uh, a couple of hundred feet above sea level, nice climate, beautiful at the center of the mineral province of India, which is the richest in the whole world. You can get from coal to uranium, everything. Uh, and that's why the British uh, uh, the government established it there. And I graduated from here. So I want to give back to my, my ideas to everybody, but uh, I believe uh, people will believe me more if I talk back to my people, and I got that proof yesterday. I called some students, they are very excited. So I propose that the IIT, ISM, should begin an energy research institute. In what model? Please don't follow the model in US. You don't need to, or in England, or in Russia, or in Japan. You have your own model. That model is called the Bose Institute. The Bose Institute, wow, the more I read about it, the more my head comes down in humble tribute to Dr. Uh, Jagadish Sandra Bosch. He was trained, he went by ship to England in 1880 to study under Lord Calvin, you know, uh, really, you know, uh, as, as you remember, he was, uh, uh, later on, he's known as Lord Kelvin. And I have some nice slides. You know, please watch this. I really want you to see through yourself. He was a man of the level of whoever you see. You have to judge him by his research work, applied research, not you know, just something go and earn something. No. And you go through the next slides, you will see it. He had a student called Satyendranath Bose, S. N. Bose. And if you remember, Bose Einstein statistic, that is not statistics, a statistic. There is no S, there is no lie, okay? And you know Boson. Uh, so ultimately, with that, we may be able to store sunlight just like we store electron in batteries or in capacitors for later use, just like we store oil in a, in a canister or gas in a canister, CNG. With that idea, now it, it, it may be uh, uh, possible after 200 or 300 years, I guess, to store sunlight and then use it whenever it was portable. That came from his student, I know, S. N. Bose, S. N. Bose. He didn't even have a PhD. He doesn't need S. N. Bose. And there was M. N. Saha, Magnat Saha, physics, those master blaster physicists. Do you think it is only Einstein or Niels Bohr? Okay. <coughs> the meat is there. Anyone who has not heard the name of the equation, Saha equation, S. A. S. A. He, that person is not fit to have a degree in science or engineering. In magneto, magneto heterodynamics, okay, MSD, who is, goes to rocket science, they use Saha equation. There's no such thing as a modified Saha equation or improved or better than Saha equation. Those equations are formulated <coughs> from the students of J.C. Bose in the 1920s and 30s, okay? And I have been fortunate to study Magna Chah's physics book in the first year and second year of my engineering at ISM. And the professor was equally competent. You know, maybe he's no longer on earth. You know, his name was uh, Professor, he had a DSC. Just like J.C. Bose, he earned, got a D, Doctor of Science degree, not by attending classes. After he came back, he wrote two papers and sent to Lord Calvin 
and Lord Cadbane convinced London University, oh my God, we should not give him a DSC degree. He got it like that, okay? <coughs> so, uh, Magna Ch and my professor, Mahon also got DSC from Calcutta University, or uh, you know, the college from where JC Bose was, uh, famous professor, and Saha equation. And does it end there? No. That city of Calcutta became the hub, number one in all of Asia. Japan was not in the picture at the time, in the 1920s. You'll see. He is called Sar C. B. Raman. Now, anywhere you go for material characterization, gas characterization, he was Raman spectroscopy, and he got Nobel on that in 1930, Raman. So on from the same, you know, nerve center. So uh, this new research energy, Geoenergy Research uh, Institute I'm proposing for Indian School of Mines, uh, Dhanbad, and I'll give my everything, my full service from here and there, free of SAR, that will be as much in uh, you know, with my own inspiration, plus doubled by the spirit of Sir J.C. Bose. He did not do any patenting. He said, patenting is a crime. We got knowledge free, we should give it back free. And if you look USPTO, there is one patent in his name as the, you know, for example, for his uh, invention of microwave, he is the first in the world, you know, not a, uh, a microwave in the millimeter range, but he didn't patent it. Some two ladies from America, I think from MIT, when he came for to give some demonstration, this is no professor, you should patent it. We'll do everything for you. You just say, yes, like no. He said, okay, if you insist. And they paid uh, the patent fee and everything. And he never looked back, okay, and put that invention. And that invention was used by Marconi to rectify, okay, you know, the diode. They used to call coherer. But later on, a professor at uh, uh, California, uh, no, Berkeley University, he was from India, from electronics engineering. He convinced that big super organization called IEEE, I -E -E -E, and proved through that pattern everything. And after that, the U.S. Supreme Court rejected the patent of Marconi. So the credit goes to this humble man. And he is to head patent. And this is the building he built in 1918. See, this is the research center, 1918, the Bose Institute. And, and where did he live? Far away from there? No, this is his residence. So he used his own land to build the research institute. Can you find another man with his own money and in his own land, he builds a research institution. And it is so world famous. Why is world famous? This is the same building, you know, you know repainted and so this is the old one. Of course, it has now more buildings. So I have to show you that it is not just another building and that research institute. Look. Who went there to pay tribute to him? All this first paragraph are Nobel laureates, Mays Bow, Archibald Hill, all are Nobel laureate. They went to visit and see his work in his absence because he died in 1937. And then all those world famous scientists like George Gamo, my childhood hero, I used to read his physics uh, you know, articles translated into my mother language when I was in the sixth grade, George Gamo about the universe. Talking. So, and with time it has grown only more. So here is the humble man and you read about this, you enjoy. And the last but not the least, this is a 12 meter telescope in Arizona. They created in uh, some year, I think, uh, I have Put the date somewhere, okay? Uh, the previous. And they used his some uh, equation, uh, some of his uh, methods of microwave, you know, microwave transmission in that telescope. So read about that. This is the man. And he was invited by Lord Kelvin 
to demonstrate his invention okay, at the Royal Society, you know, in the Royal Society, number one in the world of science. And he demonstrated he was only age 38. And after that, you know, he wrote a paper how to, in at that time, his third paper was how to measure the wavelength of this radiation, you know, electromagnetic wave. He's the first one. He created that and he used it uh, for many practical demonstrations as a remote control. And look at that. So with that, I have come to an end ultimately. And uh, those of you who attended, uh, please, uh, this is only the beginning of the journey. I am passing my, not this dirty thing I started my career with, with ONGC, but whatever is small, the lamp I have, perfectly smokeless or CO2-less of knowledge and experience so that we can carry it further, okay? So if there is any Bengali speaking among you, my mother tongue, I'll say to you, Prithibir chabi tomake diegelam. Means in English, I am giving to the, the key of the art, which art in your hand. I did whatever I could, but now it is, I'm passing it to your hand, okay? Of course, I am telling it to every one of you, including you, young, brilliant student, Rahima Babayev. Make good use of life. For the sake of knowledge and engineering, enhancement, and in an applied way, because the world is that. Your future generations will pray for you and pray for me, hopefully, okay? And that's it. I'm here. Thank you, Pierre Petro. Thank you, Arab Oil and Gas Academy, for supporting my humble presentations. And I'll be more open to you. Uh, you know, and I hope uh, you have time and uh, room to accommodate me. You know, uh, but I'm thankful for giving me this wonderful opportunity. And this is my Hamas disclaimer. I used to put at the beginning. So this is the last, so I put at the end. And here is the one. It is his spirit and my spirit together to give to you, to share the ideas and to create a roadmap for sustainable energy engineering program. So I promise to those uh, junior, uh, senior students at Indian School of Mines that I'll write a proposal uh, to the respected director of uh, the Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, I heard he is a great person, and uh, and uh, I'll uh, uh, request for a Zoom meeting with him. Uh, first, I write a letter giving the outline of uh, this new Energy Research Institute, and I hope you will all pray for its success. And having said that, in Cairo, you have a brilliant research center with Professor Hussein Abdel Al. So join him, make it bigger, make it well known at King Fahd University, where I was fortunate, you know, I was privileged to study masters. And then I had the privilege to work there as research engineer for 16 years. And also at the same time as assistant professor, then raised to associate professor. They have a wonderful, that's a wonderful place, you know, like a rose in the desert or, you know, or, or in the sand. It's a beautiful place of knowledge, a research institute. I hope they add more feather, you know, into their wings, okay? Comes up excellence. Don't patent unless you need it. Don't waste money, whether it is your money or government money or the company or the research fund money. Patent when you must. That's what Sir Zagadish Sandra Bose did. I didn't know, now I know, but I did it myself. I didn't patent my anything, despite tremendous pressure, the vice president of Texas Tech University. I said, no, the time hasn't come. What I've done in the lab, but I'll keep it in your honor. Let's make a compromise. I'll not publish it. This, this is an embargo, but then after five years, I removed it, and one PhD thesis came out of it in 2017. And Professor Suleiman uh, made good use of that resource I left behind. He has uh, carried this uh, uh, this PhD you know, achievement. Uh, I was not there at the time. They have reported the work. I'm not as happy 
because they just confirmed my, I wanted them something to do on top, uh, but uh, hopefully they'll do it. And I want them to consult me free of charge uh, for the sake of the profession and service to humanity. Thank you very much. I'm done with Alma. Thank you so much for this extremely insightful and informative session, uh, Dr. Afigo. We really enjoyed this four days uh, journey. It was really, really great. Thank you very much. Uh, we are very grateful that you took the time out of your busy schedule to address our group. Thank you very much. Yes, you must have uh, we, really, uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also, uh, guys, please do not forget to finish and submit the quiz before deadline. Moreover, you can rewatch this lecture again from Pia Petrus YouTube channel. Thank you very much for everyone for your attention, and thank you to your professor. Thank Stay you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye.